In a recent public opinion survey, it found that 62% of respondents knew little or nothing about the death penalty in Singapore. A death sentence is the harshest and most final punishment that our country's criminal justice system can inflict upon an individual. Like all national policies, it is a reflection of us and of the society that we live in. It's also a policy that has the support of an overwhelming majority of Singaporeans. That same survey found 70% support. But the majority of Singaporeans have now also said that they don't know very much about it. So for today's talk, I would like to focus our attention on a small group of people who do know about the death penalty and who have seen it at work from up close. Whether we oppose or support the death penalty, we need to base our opinions on an understanding of how it actually works and how it plays out in Singapore today. So with We Believe in Second Chances, which is an abolitionist group in Singapore, I have been working with the families of death row inmates for over six years now. And the experiences of these uh, condemned prisoners and their families don't often feature in the intellectual debates about capital punishment in Singapore, but it's still crucial to an understanding of how things actually work. In Singapore, executions are carried out by long drop hanging. Seven people died in this way last year. We recently heard that one person was executed just yesterday, although the prison authorities have not yet responded to our queries to confirm this. What happens in a long drop hanging is that the prisoner is taken to the execution chamber, a hood is placed over their head, the rope is positioned, and the trap door opens. If all measurements are correct, the spinal cord will snap, killing them instantly. But if the drop is too long or too short, the prisoner could be decapitated or struggle to breathe as they strangle to death. This is Ko Jabing, just days before he was executed on 20th May 2016 for murder. It was his sister's birthday. He is dressed in the clothes that his mother, Lunduk, and his sister, Jumai, bought for him shortly after they were informed of his imminent execution. So what happens is, in the week, at some point in the week before the scheduled execution, the inmate is allowed to put on civilian clothes and poses for photos. These photos are then given to the families as mementos of the one that they've lost. So imagine having to go to a shop and to buy an outfit for your child, your brother, your, your partner, knowing that it's the last outfit that they will ever wear. Imagine having to stand there and try to guess what size you're supposed to buy, because you haven't had physical contact for so long that you no longer have a sense of size or shape of that person. This is exactly what Lunduk and Jumai had to do one night, standing in the well-stocked aisles of Mustafa in Little India, surrounded by all these shoppers. They were trying to figure out what size to buy because they said Jabing had put on a lot of weight since he entered prison. Which actually isn't surprising because death row inmates are confined to their cells 23 hours a day. We think of it as a very morbid practice, giving you know, photo shoots, giving photos to the families. But Jumai actually told me that she likes these photos. Because she said, it doesn't look like he's in prison, and if I close my eyes, I can imagine that he didn't die. So I've worked for over six years on this issue because I believe that the system we have is deeply problematic and that there isn't enough support for these families. In my experience, the inmates tend to come from ethnic minority groups, and they also tend to come from relatively low-income backgrounds or situations where their choices and opportunities were more limited than the ones that many of us in this room have ever had. When someone is arrested and charged as a capital offence, it throws their family into the system of very intimidating court trials and very confusing legalese. The families themselves have committed no crime, but often face the same stigma that the death row inmate is faced with, which makes it even more difficult for them to talk openly about what has happened. So we see wives suddenly become single parents, having to care for children at home and anxious husbands in prison. We've seen parents religiously presenting themselves at Changi Prison every week just to see their child behind a pane of glass for less than an hour. And I've also sat with siblings in court and watched them struggle to follow the proceedings, 
Proceedings which would be very difficult to understand if you didn't have a law degree, even if English was your first language, which very often for these people it's not. But there is a silver lining to being in court, because usually what happens is after the court hearing, the family is allowed to speak to the inmate. They go up to the dock, and like prison, there is a pane of glass separating the prisoner from everyone else. But unlike prison. There is a slit in this glass that allows the inmate to speak to interpreters or lawyers, and time after time, I've seen the family members go up to that slit and put their hands through to the waiting inmates on the other side. And this slit is not big enough for them to hold hands, but just to touch fingertips. Sometimes they do this and then they pray, and sometimes they just talk, but always, always they hold on tight because it's the only time that they can touch each other. We actually know very little about what goes on in Changi Prison because the death penalty in Singapore is shrouded in secrecy. Everyone who works with death row inmates—the prison officers, the counselors, the doctors, the executioner himself or herself—we don't know who that is—are bound by the Official Secrets Act to not talk about what goes on. But sometimes we hear from the inmates themselves. And through conversations with the families, my colleagues and I glean an insight into a life on death row, and what it must be like to just be sitting there waiting. We hear about the friendships that form between the cells. We hear about the support and the solidarity that grows. We are told that when an execution is imminent, the inmate is allowed a budget to choose whatever they want for their last meal, but that they sometimes choose instead to use that money on their friends. So, like, they will buy a can of coke for everybody on death row. They are then allowed to go from cell to cell. They shake hands and they say farewell. And we are told by the other inmates that they can hear the opening thump of the trap door from their cells, and that's how they know it's over. And on death row, they call this being sent back or going home. People like Koja Bing. Or like Chijoke Stephen Obioha, who was executed in November last year for trafficking two kilos of cannabis, have broken Singapore's laws. That is true. Others on death row have committed even more heinous crimes, like multiple murders. But the important thing is that the death penalty system is not of their doing; it is of ours. It is a system that we choose to implement, and we are one of a decreasing number of countries around the world to do so. And because it's something that we choose to do, then we need to do what we condemn criminals for not doing. We need to actually pay attention. We need to think about the consequences and the impact of our actions on other human beings. And we need to ask ourselves whether what we're doing is right. Decades of research in the U.S. have not been able to conclude that the death penalty deters crimes like murder, and there is a lack. Of similar research in Singapore, and so there's actually no way that we can say with any certainty that the death penalty and all these executions are any more effective than any other punishment that we already have in our criminal justice system. I will never actually have enough time to fully convey to you the human experience of the death penalty in Singapore, and there is just so much that we still don't know. Information is very hard to come about. There is no official information on the number of people currently sitting on Singapore's death row, although our estimate puts it at about 20 men. We don't know about the women because we don't hear from female inmates. These are the names of some of the men that we know to be on death row. Some of them could be executed by the time the year is out, which means more post photos. For more families, and what we do know is that in the months and years to come, there will be more men and women who will be sitting in the dock, and they will be sentenced to death, and they will join these names to wait for that date with the gallows. And we know that we'll see these families in court, and that these families will go up to the glass, and they will put their hands through, and they will hold on tight. But what I want to leave you with today, at the end of this long day of inspiring talks about the diversity and 
you know, wonders of life and human experiences is the question of, while these families are holding on tight, what will we be doing? Thank you.